got the gradient of you know, the really big plants got most tea, and then the less one, the next one didn't as much, and the next one not as much, and, that, and no tea. So, some examples that are really, really clear, and other things where it's kind of like, mm -hmm. and of course, that's to me that they aren't paying attention to the important things. If there's successes sometimes, if there's not success, why aren't they looking at what most everybody knows is the important thing when you're making tea. It seems a little obvious, but they pay no attention to the biology at all. You know, we do have a bunch of a number of the different tea brewers here. So uh, those of you who might want to come up here, it's um, Western Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program, USDA, University of Hawaii. There's the ISDN number. I'm sure you can get all the Ted with Radovich or uh, Norman or Rikon um, and get copies of it if you're interested. So I'll just uh, leave it up here. If anyone wants to pass it around, I see. Is that your copy of your book? Yes. You've got one already. And where did I leave this? Especially on making this um, Maybe I need to do a little looking up. 
So, bovaria is a fungus that produces an enzyme that drills its way, the enzyme drills its way through the chitin exoskeleton of insects. So any soft-bodied insect or insects that have soft um, underbellies, uh, bovaria, if it lands on your insect, when the bovaria is in an active form, the end, this fungus is going to be making that enzyme drills a hole through. So here's my beetle and containing chompers to be healthy. Does that look like a beetle? No. Not quite, but yeah, okay. Uh, artistic license. <laughs> so let's say this uh, bovaria, there's the spore, it's germinated and growing. That um, fungal hypha will now chew its way into the internal parts of that uh, beetle and ramify or grow throughout the beetle, killing it. And then it puts hyphae outside. It produces billions and billions of spores of the bovaria. So you are leaving behind some inoculum, things that will prevent any further outbreak of these kinds of insects. What about microarthropods? Microarthropods, they can, the bovaria can do a pretty good job on any microarthropod as well. And so the, really the only effective time is when you take the spores and get them to germinate. Once these spores, once they're spores, they only germinate under very particular conditions. Luckily, most of these spores will germinate in a compost heat, precisely the condition that will vary the lights. High in humic acid, good folics, got a good set of food, and so all the spores of the bovaria will germinate. And so you spray it out, if it contacts a beetle, bovaria will start growing on your leaf surfaces, they'll start growing. So for the next three, four days, you are probably going to have control any, you know, any of these beetles that walk by, any of the microarthropods, any of the aphids, white flies that come in contact with the germinated spore. The spore sticks to the animal and uh, basically turns it into a big fuzzy white ball. What about nematodes? They don't go after nematodes, so sorry, not, not affected there. Um, they, if you sprayed it out on your pasture where you had some tongue beetles operating, you probably would lose your tongue beetles. And your ladybugs? They would also probably do a job on ladybugs. So you don't use this just preventatively. You use this when you've got a problem. Any biocontrol agent, you only use it when you have an outbreak, when you have a problem, when all else has already failed. So, you know, in the case of your coffee bean problem, let's get a bovaria out there at exactly the moments that your beetle is wandering around trying to attack your um, coffee bean. Make sure that all of the adults get the bovaria on them and, and wipe them out before they ever get inside the bean. If it's white flies, it works pretty well there too. That's what you were talking about, that's the time loss carry the bovaria. Mm -hmm. We'll get it inside, you know, so could we get that inside the bean where the um, larva is already, the egg has been laid. Bovaria, you typically buy it at um, you know, a nursery, at a garden store, something like that. It comes in a, a pint size or a quart size bottle. What this actually is, is full of billions of spores of the bovaria. Typically, the instructions on the package say, Take all the spores in this package, dump it into a quart of water, or a gallon of water, mix it up really well, and spray it out. Almost never works when you do it that way. Because how often are one of these spores actually going to fall into a place where the habitat is perfectly right to get them to wake up and work? So a lot of failures if you apply it according to the directions on the bottle. 
And a jug of these things is not real cheap. I mean, we're talking three, four hundred dollars for a container of this. So get the small size, and instead, all we need is a teaspoon into 500 gallon tea brew. We need one teaspoon. If you're doing this into your five gallon bucket, you take a pinch. A couple thousand spores is all we need. Run it through the tea brewing cycle, so 24 to 48 hours, depending on temperature. And then spray it out. Make sure that you're spraying it in the area where you have the insect problem. And the bovaria takes out the um, insects that you don't want. Just be careful that you're not spraying it and taking out the other things that you do want. So let's say you've got a, a problem, and maybe right after this you want to spray out your lady beetles or your lace wings or your other um, biocontrol um, wasps, things like that. So um, you're going to add this to our big brew tea? Or no, we yes. added it to so we can brew it all together. This one goes out at the beginning. So when you're putting your foods in there, dump your little bit of uh, bovaria spore in there, most goes into the uh, brewer. It's always kind of fun to take um, a couple of those spores, put them in the water, and learn what they look like. And then when you're looking at your compost tea after the brew cycle, you can recognize the germinated bovaria spores and that they really are ready to go and um, deal with your insect problem. Make certain you do not use bovaria when you want your bees to be pollinating your plants because uh, bovaria will take out honeybees as well. So don't be spraying it when you have bees out there working your um, property. But as a biocontrol agent, be careful. You don't use these as preventatives. So trichoderma. Here's another one. Trichoderma is a fungus that is parasitic on other fungi. Same thing with gliocladium. It's a fungus that attacks and consumes other fungi. When, and after I started working on this one, there were reports that these trichoderma, these specific species, were um, only attacking these kinds of fungi. And this gliocladium, this species, only attack these kinds of fungi. Well, that's cool. We can have really, you know, focused um, par parasitism. So we started working on that, looking at whether these um, trichoderma or gliocladia are really that specific. No, they are not. Just a little bit of hype out there in the literature. So trichoderma, once again, you buy a container of trichoderma from the store. Um, spores in there, uh, 500 gallon brewer, you put a teaspoon in, small ga uh, five gallon, you put a pinch. And the idea is again, that spore germinates and starts to grow. Whenever that spore contacts a fungal hypha, it wraps itself around the outside of that fungal hypha, chews holes into the um, host, and eats the other fungus from the inside out. Non specific. So, quite useful if you're having an outbreak of mildew, an outbreak of blight. You know, things have already gone south for your organisms, for your, for your plants. You didn't get the biology into the system in the way it needed to be to prevent these problems. Your plants aren't going to be healthy. So, okay, we've got ways to come back along and fix some of this problem. This next year, make sure that you've got your biology balance so you don't have to use these extreme measures. One of the things about trichoderma is it attacks anything. So what if you've spent a very long time trying to get the right mycorrhizal fungi growing on the root systems of your plants? Now you have a mildew outbreak up above, 
and you apply Bovaria, excuse me, Trichoderma in large quantities, and by accident, <coughs> some of that gets sprayed on, sprayed on the soil. <coughs> Those Trichoderma will go after your mycorrhizal fungi. So we were working with um, the Mirage Hotel in Las Vegas. And when um, they sent their um, grass samples in, it must have been like April, April and May, I can't remember. And those root systems of those grasses had 80% colonization mycorrhizal fungi on their root systems. Very good. If anything, a little high. Um, not really pleased, really happy, really healthy grass. Then they sent samples in come July. And the root systems of those grasses had 4% colonization. How can that happen? And so the uh, groundskeeper at the Mirage was like, what happened? This can't possibly happen. You can't lose your mycorrhizal fungi. There's nothing that we do to cause this problem. Probably did do something. So, can you tell me everything that you did that between April and July? Well, we didn't do anything different. There was absolutely no change. You don't know what you're talking about. No. Okay, so we lost that client. Um, what did they do? Once that head groundskeeper left, because you're not going to keep your job long if you have that kind of attitude, um, and the next. Um, head of the horticulture department came in, we went back and started to look into what happened, what was going on here. They were buying their um, compost tea kits from a company up in Oregon. And um, for, you know, all for a couple of years, they had been having good results, doing just great. But what we discovered was that in May of that year, that company decided to start to put trichoderma into their compost tea kit. So they put a huge number of spores of trichoderma into their compost tea. These guys used that kit kind of willy-nilly, not asking, not paying any attention to the change. And so they started putting out, come um, mid-May, they were putting trichoderma out with every compost tea spray that they were putting out. So once every two weeks, once every three weeks, trichoderma was going out. So we were seeing the result of the trichoderma wiping out the mycorrhizal fungi on the root systems of their plants. We knew exactly what we were doing. Trichoderma in a, in a mycorrhizal inoculum makes no sense. So as soon as you get your mycorrhizal spores germinated and starting to grow on your root system and the mycorrhizal fungi start putting those hyphae out, into the soil along from the trichoderma and wham, wipes them out. So look out when you're buying mycorrhizal fungi because we've got companies that sell mycorrhizal fungi and they're adding trichoderma in with adenosine. What are they thinking? So trichoderma, we claim him only again when you're in an extreme condition. The mildew is coming on and you want to deal with it and get rid of it right away. Um, we have a blight outbreak, we have a vermicillium outbreak, we have a whatever horrible fungus is um, doing what it shouldn't be doing and you want to deal with it, that's a good way to um, deal with the problem. Dollar spot on golf course greens, but of course now you're weaponizing your mycorrhizal fungi at the same time. You're going to have to be inoculate your mycorrhizal fungi and, and resuscitate from there. Question. What is a rust? What is a rust? Do you know what rust is? That it's a fungus. Um, it's a fungus that tends to um, attack uh, grains. And that's where the grains have you know, a commercial problem with uh, rusts and smuts. They're very related. Great set of, of uh, microorganisms. How do you smuts. Those? Pardon? How do you find those? Uh, we'll try Real easy. Um, typically, if you can get out, when you know that you're looking at the environmental conditions that will bring on a rust or smut outbreak, you want to get out there with your compost tea and get everything covered. And if you can do that, you don't have to fuss around with the trichoderma and the, the palladium.
But uh, if you've been a little behind the times and you haven't really been paying attention and you start getting rusts and smuts growing on your on your um, grains, put trichoderma into your compost and it usually does a really good job of knocking off the rusts and the smuts. And that's the same thing that grows in trees, right? Like why they have there are a number of very specific rusts to come from trees, and those can be a lot more difficult to deal with because um, a lot of times the rust gets inside the needles, and the roots are inside the needles. They're really difficult to deal with. So, when the trichoderma has done its work, how do we finish it up? How do we get rid of it? Because once the trichoderma has wiped out most of your fungi in your soil, it's going to go to sleep and it produces spores. And unless you're taking those spores and putting them back into concentrated humic acid, they really don't tend to germinate and grow. Only if you get, if those spores are now in the middle of a fungal outbreak, and there's lots and lots of fungi, which is typically only something that you see in a disease causing situation, those trichoderma, trichoderma don't generally wake up and start to grow. So my question more specifically is, we're we talking about the, uh, the golf course in Las Vegas, and they spray the trichoderma and kill the mycorrhizal, and they need to re-inoculate the mycorrhizal because the trichoderma is there. Yep, but we're not going to get those mycorrhizal fungi growing up to real high concentrations any time in the near future. So maybe if we ever got the mycorrhizal fungi back up to 80% colonization, I might start worrying. But then the trichoderma is not going to do the everything is being wiped out. It would be in very localized conditions. So because it's hard to it's, get rid of it. Right, not really going to get rid of it, and you probably don't want to get rid of it. But you're not going to have widespread damage to your mycorrhizal fungi because we're not ever probably going to have to put those trichoderma out again like that. But it's only because we germinated and grew all of those trichoderma and then we spray them out all at the same time that we see that devastating wipe out of the fungi in the system. If you have to do it to protect your plant, you're going to have to do it to protect your plant. Do they you cold hmm? they cold yeah. Oh yeah, you've got trichoderma in your soil. you got trichoderma in your compost pile. Uh, trichoderma, uh, uh, you know, when you look at your orange in the, oranges in the refrigerator and you get those real dark green, the pelly green spores on the surface of your orange, that's trichoderma. The lightish green color ones, that's penicillin. So trichoderma is with us all the time. It's just that when we have an outbreak of a fungal disease, we got to wipe out that fungal plague with a plague of trichoderma. And it does have some fallout. So now my next question would be, can I just take and scrape the dark green off of my orange and put it into my tea? Yeah, you probably can. Well, that's expensive. I think. <laughs> <laughs> some mycorrhizal fungi. Again, typically we put those spores into the compost tea. But you don't put mycorrhizal spores in at the beginning of the brew cycle. These guys go in at the beginning of the root cycle, so we want them to germinate and be growing. So when you spray, they're ready to roll and take out the problem organism. Mycorrhizal fungi are very sensitive to being jiggled, to being bounced, to being pushed around. So we want them to be added as spores right at the end of the root cycle, right before you're going to put your seeds in there, right before you put your bare root. Um, plants the root system in there. And they, the spore attaches onto any organic matter. They are very non specific about organic matter. So we don't really want those spores to be coming up against any other kind of organic matter than our seeds and our root systems. <coughs> there have been a lot of times where um, mycorrhizal people will recommend to golf courses or I recommend to people with lawns that they um, spray the, uh, the mycorrhizae out onto the surface of their turf. Do mycorrhizae spores colonize, colonize your leaf surfaces? Do they colonize your crowns? 
neuron. But that's when we spray our, when we take our little sprayer canister, and now we're out here spraying, it's going to hit the leaves, it's going to hit the crowns, it's going to hit the thatch. It doesn't make it through to the root system. Waste of your money. We got to get the spores to the root system. So the time to put mycorrhizal fungi into your tea brew is when you're going to do the cores, when you're going to do a core aeration in your turf. And now you spray the compost tea so it's going down that core hole, contacting the root systems of your plant. Now it works like a charm. Do I put it in for like the last 10 minutes of bubbling, something like that? Yep. Or you know, you're driving out there with your compost tea, and now you're about to start spraying, so you dump your spores in, off you go. They've got five or six hours before they'll actually start germinating once we put them into a tea, but not 24 hours. They're, they're bombers if you put them in at the beginning of the recycle. Um, so you mentioned that not all plants like to like rise with polymer, but um, is there, do we know where that line is? Is that line in that, in that cycle of growth like you're talking about? So, that's like in the in the fungal dominated. Once you get fungal dominated, they like mycorrhizal or no? Um, the conversion. Uh, we got weeds first stage right, right. succession. Right. Then we go to the brassica. These are the wetland, the riparian grasses, uh, plants, um, coal and kale crops. Right. There's the cutoff right there. When we move on to your veggies, almost all of our veggies require mycorrhizal colonization, except for the brassica, the kale, the coal, the crops, the broccoli, and the cauliflower. Uh, then when we get into um, greens, grow crops, they all need uh, mycorrhizal colonization. So the cutoff is right there. These are non-mycorrhizal, for the most part, and these are mycorrhizal. What do you want to and Yeah, you could definitely select against your weeds by getting mycorrhizal spores out in your in the soil and the root system. Okay. So you can buy these other ones. Can you buy mycorrhizal? Yep, you can buy mycorrhizal spores. Yeah, we can buy them all in the industry. Yeah, or go online and Google them and find them. Uh, the company, there's a couple companies that make mycorrhizal inocula, and today, when, when we've been checking them, that's the strangest thing in the world, but Monsanto usually sends in um, these uh, spores from all these different companies and has us check them. So, we like to know this information, so we let Monsanto pay us to <laughs> check the spores. <laughs> so, uh, there's a company called Mycorrhizal Applications. Mycorrhizal Applications. And they usually have a very good mycorrhizal inoculum. There's another company that just recently has come way up in the world. RTI out of California is another one. Um, I used to be kind of mm, not good results from them, but this year their um, their inoculum is probably actually been better for mycorrhizal applications. But they're both real good companies typically. Or now they I would put them uh, right up there kind of neck and neck. Most of the other companies that make mycorrhizal inocula actually buy their inoculum from one of these two companies and then repackage it and put trichoderm in it or something bizarre. So either one, um, RTI is out of um, California, Southern California down here in Lake.
What's the name of it? Thomas. Carmen Rodgers. Carmen Starden. Yes. Bacteria. Um, there are a number of pseudomonas that um, do a really good job of breaking down very toxic materials. So a number of pseudomonas are uh, inoculum that you can buy at uh, most nurseries or garden stores or go online, um, go looking for them. And so pseudomonas, if you think you have a nasty compound, you've got some pesticides, you've got some residues in your soil that are preventing your biology from being able to establish and start growing. You go buy some pseudomonas, throw them in there with a lot of sugar, and let them chew up some of that material, and only then, the next time you apply a compost or compost seed, the other organisms will really take off for you. Bacillus. Lots of these bacteria have very nasty compounds that they make that are deterrents to various kinds of insects. So Bacillus subtilis, uh, Bacillus sterofermentophilus. They all are pretty good at making your insects go someplace else. They don't kill them, they just say, this is not, and that's like what the Obi-Wan Kenobi, these are not the droids you want. And that's what those bacillus are saying. These are not plants. <laughs> Azotobacter, rhizobium, these are the nitrogen fixing. This is the free liver. This is a, uh, the, the one that associates with legumes, and of course you buy these things. More and more, I'm seeing a lot more of the nitrogen free liver, nitrogen mixing bacteria come on the market. I haven't really had a chance to evaluate how good they are. Nematodes. Um, Skyner Luma gets um, named in honor of the biodynamic world. Um, Rudolph Steiner with Steiner Nema. Just to give you another wonderful word that you can use to impress your friends. Entomo pathogenic. It's right up there with supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. This means insect pathogen. So it is a nematode that is specific for the larval stages of weevils. So if you have vollworm, if you have uh, weevils on your rhododendrons, on azaleas, on various of your tropical plants, you know, so if you're looking at your leaves, and your leaves are supposed to be nice and Full like that, and what you see are those big C level cuts out of them. So it looks like somebody just, that's typically weevil damage. And so, what you would want to do is buy some of those Sanima. They come on window screen material, and you just let it soak. So, all the sticky stuff that's holding your nematodes on the screen um, is washed into the water. And then you drench the area around the plant and the plants that have those weevils and those uh, entomopathogenic spangernema will attack and consume the larval stage of the weevils. They don't go after the adults, they go after the larvae. So your current crop of uh, adults are going to continue to cause some damage. You might want to think about um, ovaria and uh, get rid of your fetal um, problem. Heterorapidus is a nematode. It's a, it's a bacterial feeding nematode, which people always find kind of interesting that it could be having any interesting effect. But it carries a bacterium that is not highly mobile, but it is a bacterium that produces an enzyme chitinase. And so the bacterium is what's going to chew its way through your, um, the surface of your um, insect, gets inside and turns that insect into a gray big culture of bacteria. So for example, root grubs. So 
No, big, nasty, disgusting, ugly looking things. <clears throat> Root grub, wire worms, um, they also work on wire worms. So the nematode carries the um, bacterium, and when the nematode brushes up against the surface of the, of the grub, it leaves behind an inoculum of those bacteria. Those bacteria drill their way into the innards of the uh, root grub and turns the inside of that root grub into a massive um, culture of bacteria. The grub will change color. And so it's usually going to go from that gray pasty color that it is in the real world to something that's uh, orange or red, purplish color. So you know that the bacterium is in there happily um, turning the whole organism into a bacterial culture, which of course then attracts the nematode to come back. And so the nematode returns, lays its eggs in here, typically thousands of eggs get laid inside here. And so when all of those eggs hatch, they're completely covered with that bacterium. And so these little destroyers go out and take out all of your other root grubs, wireworms, other root feeding problem organisms. It would be really interesting to take something like this and spray it on your coffee beans and see if we can get some of this um, heteroraptitis to go inside the bean and wipe out the larval, that larval stage of your coffee bean beetle and see if we could shut that down using the same kind of approach because the nematode is the taxi cap that moves the bacteria around. The nematode is definitely attracted to these um, larval stages of different insects. So maybe that would work. So it would be interesting to give that one a try. So biocontrol agents. There are more and more coming on the market all the time. It's something I need to do a little bit more. Ah, reading. One more thing to be done. Do you know any biocontrols that they use for virus? Um, the bovarians are used for virus. So brew up your bovaria um, with the fire ants. Um, typically, you want to go after the mount. So it can be a little fun because you want to knock a mound down so you can start pouring that bovaria Latin tea in the main chamber, or at least find the central pathway. So a mound is being built. You get a really long stick, front end loader. Knock it down, or the, uh, the fire ants come swarming out. So wait until they're done swarming. Sneak back in the dark of the night, or the uh, And just dump all of your compost tea down that uh, mound because the bovaria is going to get inside there. You want to make sure the bovaria gets down into the main chamber and uh, comes in contact with the queen ant. So you pour and run. Because again, they're going to come. And you, those are no fun. Um, termites. Well, there's some termites as well. I just don't know. So we find this. Find wherever they're coming from, and then we got a, a, a little area there. You can't find the nests. They're in the jungle. I don't know. About, we don't have them right now, but uh, these guys do. I don't know. I don't think you knew what they were. Yeah, we find something that they carry back in the nest. Yeah, that's why I'm in the So how do we get bovaria growing on that organic material? And 
have those little ants take it back to the mound. That's that'd be the only thing I would know. So uh, bubble boots, I think we've been up been through those all. Any questions about them? Phoenix? Okay. are actually present in your soil. That's a really crazy thing to try to figure out. You're going to spend a lot of money if you want to identify what the toxin is. I didn't take the attitude that I'm just going to put out a whole bunch of different monads. I'm going to put out a bunch of different organisms, some good compost. Somebody in there is going to take care of that. So you need to do the broad brush approach. Yeah. Shotgun approach. Shotgun approach because it, it can cost you a million dollars. Yeah, because there's any kind of toxins that can be disclosed. Yeah, it's just way too expensive. Now, you you want to know the labs that do that? The lab, they're all in Southern California. So there are a couple of those labs. There's like a prime lab in uh, San Diego that does those kinds of testing. And they're way expensive. We were doing some work on decomposition of dioxin. And so we had to have a lab that could detect nanogram quantities of dioxin. And so it was that lab down in Southern Cal, but they also do all kinds of different pesticides, all kinds of different What's the name again? A prime. So you can just Google laboratory assessment of fill in whatever your toxic material is that you're interested in or soil contaminants. And then you can come up with those two labs that actually will do that. Well, it's been a few years since I did that work. I tend to think of compost as being able to take care of any of those kinds of problems. I have been working with um, a laboratory with the CEDIX in France. And when we're dealing with soils that are contaminated with heavy metals, or radioactive materials. The way to clean up the soil when you have either of these kinds of problems is to put little seedlings in that you have inoculated the root systems with the correct species of mycorrhizal fungi. And the guys at the CEDICS in France are working out those specificities. They've actually got a private company that um, they started because they've worked out some of these relationships. So mycorrhizal fungi, you have to ask them for that specificity of this form to secrecy. So um, the trees, the inoculum is on that root system. So as the root grows out, the mycorrhizal fungi go out and collect the radioactive material. They go out, grab the heavy metal. And they will bring that material to the root system. And somehow or another, the plant says, no way, you are not bringing that stuff in here. Uh -uh 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 -uh. It stays out the door. You leave your shoes out there. So all of your radioactive material, you have the metal, it's laid down in the high feed right in front of the root. You have no contamination. You have no heavy metal in the plant itself. So when the plant gets big enough, they harvest the above ground part of the plant and they go sell it for, you know, whatever, board feed or pulp, I don't know. And then they will very carefully excavate the root system so they will use um, sonic um, waves so they know precisely where that root system is. And they gently lift that root system up out of the soil, shake it really gently to try to get some of the soil off so you have just the roots and these hyphae that are close to the root system where all of the contaminant has been um, concentrated. You now take that root system to a um, incinerator. incinerator, thank you. Incinerator, 
blow off all the organic matter, the roots all go, the mycorrhizal fungi all go, and now you have concentrated heavy metal, whatever it is this fungus is um, concentrating, or you're ready to have cesium, selenium, whatever, things like that, and uh, pure culture, a pure uh, material, and now you can sell that. So, works pretty well. So when you're looking at toxic materials, what kind of toxic materials might you be talking about? Arsenic. Arsenic? Yeah. These guys definitely have a mycorrhizal fungi that will grab the arsenic. So I would uh pardon? Mercury. I would expect they do. I'm not aware for sure that they do, but I would expect that that's another really important one that they could be working on. There'd be no reason to to do this without the intention of um, pulling that root system out and um, taking that concentrated heavy metal, iron, or radioactive material, whatever, and. Uh, Incinerating it so you can collect it. So, I mean, the point thing around here is that this used to be a sugar cane field, and they put a lot of arsenic out here, so a lot of the kind of crops were arsenic. And that's, I mean, you don't play that for that. But so I think this would work really well. So, um, you know, it's a possibility to get some local politicians interested in this sort of thing. And again, it would be Googling it on the internet as a, you know, I'm right up on top of the latest and greatest with this research. In, in that, that case, it's just really transported into a different location. Is some of the bacteria that actually dissolves the, the heavy metals? Bacteria don't dissolve it. If you're accumulating it in one very specific place, you're not taking it to the incinerator, and now you've got that sellable material, and it's no longer in your soil. You just cleaned up all of that problem from this huge area where the root system was. And now you've got clean, the, this ecosystem is one or two nasty chemicals more clean. Did you get all the heavy metals? You might have to do some other, but at least stepwise you can start to remove these materials without having to take all of your soil. I love it when the EP, when the EPA goes and digs up all the soil and put them into the little canisters and then they truck them off someplace and they drop them off somewhere. Great! Now instead of just having one hazardous waste site, we got two. Is this stupid? How long do those little canisters last before they decompose, waste away? It's like the concept they had about taking all the radioactive waste material from around the planet and trucking it to, where is it, Nevada, to Yucca Mountain, and going down there, you know, 20 miles deep into the Earth's surface and dropping off all those little canisters. Any active living growing bacteria and fungi down there in those caverns that would happily chew up the glass containers long before 5,000 years from now? Oh yeah. Yeah, so where does all that stuff move once it becomes a um, So they didn't actually pull that one, you know, they didn't do that. So now they're going to ship it off to the moon. And who knows? But we do have a problem with these things. So. Uh, what kind of tea to make? You know, so I think we've been over this. These are a couple of examples. So, um, Christmas trees. Uh, a little bit out of the norm for Hawaii, but I think there's some take messages here. In this study, what they did with some of these beds got, um, well, back up one, in Christmas tree production, and most tree production anywhere on the planet, we have some really nasty fungal diseases. And so in this particular case, we've got needle cast. So the needle cast attacks the needles and uh, basically defoliates the plant, Huge problem with the Christmas tree industry. How are we going to deal with it? Well, there are a number of fungicides that they've been using. The fungicides are becoming ineffective because 
the fungus is developing resistance. So can we do it from a sustainable, biological point of view? So some of the beds got applications of compost seeds, the other got the normal chemical treatment. Some of the beds got half of it was treated with tea, the other half with the typical chemical. Um, so we've got those comparisons. So the first, this is March, you can see the last snowfall basically. April 30th, the first application of tea went out, second, third. Here are the trees are on June 11th. The grower is saying, I don't, I can't see any difference between the uh, chemically treated trees and the biologically treated trees. And we were like, well, that's a good thing, isn't it? Because the biologically treated trees did not have any needle casts. No, neither do your chemical ones, which is a less expensive uh, material for you to apply. Uh, okay, so it made sense to him. The agriculturalist working with him said, well, you know, when we're dealing with trees, the first place you see an effect on tree growth is typically in the root system. But you have Christmas trees. So we dug up some of the trees. All of the little seedlings that have compost tea applied to them. The root system, massive number of fine roots, all becoming colonized with actinomycorrhizal fungi, much healthy, healthier plants. Those that are in the commercial chemical system, the roots are long and skinny, they're searching, they're looking for nutrients, um, not nearly as healthy. In the next year, the leader on this thing put on two years worth of growth. This only had one year's of growth. The next, the second year after that, this, um, these seedlings with the, been treated with a biology, put on another two years of growth. So these seedlings at um, four years old look like seven-year-old trees. And so they harvested these trees when they were three years old. These trees they could not harvest until they were eight. So this guy was terribly excited and I don't have any more data on this project because I had to sneak this picture in order to show it to you because I don't want anybody else knowing about this. <laughs> Growers, I have to love them. So um, I like this one, you know, uh, start with aerobic compost. Okay, tell me about this compost pile. Oh, yes. yes. I love the weeds. They're right out of the compost pile. If this was good compost and properly balanced, you wouldn't have any weeds. So being suspicious of compost piles where you have weeds growing out of them. I don't think we have the biology that we need. Um, they were using pipes to try to get oxygen down into the middle of the pile. But the weeds certainly concerned me when I saw that. Jolly Farmer up in uh, Canada. This, this is their composting operation. So uh, they have somebody come in first thing in the morning to measure all the piles that um, are likely to be neatly turned. Uh, they pull the covers off those piles. When the turner guys comes in, they come in and turn the piles, put the covers back on, and then they go to making more compost piles. So um, their turner um, is a real uh, homemade job. It's kind of fun, kind of cute. Good compost that they're making. These are their tea brewers. So old dairy tanks work pretty well because the insides of a dairy tank there are absolutely no 90 degree corners. We learned this in the food microbiology world years ago. At 90 degree corners is always where you're going to get the biofilm starting to grow first. You can't keep this clean enough. You can't get good movement of the water through there. This is what's going to go stagnant. No 90 degree turns. Smooth them out. Make them rounded. Something like that. Air comes down. PVC pipe in the bottom with just flat holes on the PVC <coughs> pipe. Two plugs in the end. That's aeration. So the water comes up. You get your um, vortex through the length of that tank. Now, when they first started working with us, they would just start putting, throwing the compost free into the water. 
and uh, they gummed up prayers all the time. It's just a horrible mess. Uh, they tried doing a Turner thing, to, a trauma screen to get the, here's our trauma screen, tried to use this to um, wash the tea through and tie up, no, it just doesn't work. It's crazy to do this. So um, they started using uh, bags in their compost. We were in that fourth way there. The GOT brewer, I think I've described this. So there's your um, pump. There it goes down to the aeration, so you get a, the vortex going this way. This is the bag that holds the compost, so aeration coming down in there. Little pipe, so your compost is constantly moving and mixing. This is your microbial liberation chamber. So, um, pretty good system. I like this one. Um, very easy to connect. Um, easy connect. Um, this just fits right on there and you can put the uh, plant down. Um, so there we are looking at putting the compost into the system. There goes the humic acid in. I did this backwards. Should put the humic acid first in. And then the compost. Uh, and some people like to um, send their compost tea long distances. So with these folks, they are making the compost tea on the eastern seaboard and then they ship it to the Mississippi River Valley. And so they've got to put the aerators in the totes so that that compost tea stays aerated for the whole two day trip to the middle part of the US. Um, don't do this in the middle of the summer because if you cook your compost on the middle of the, uh, in the middle of the summer and you know, the temperatures, Gosh, this summer we have been hitting temperatures of 115 uh, throughout the um, Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, Iowa, Nebraska, Denver. This is going to kill us. Spring and fall works fine, not in the middle of the summer, and mm, not in the middle of winter either. Although, who would need it in the middle of winter? You would. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you would. I'm going to bring it over to Yeah, I'm going to do a spot of orange. You're going to have to make it here. Um, Dirt Simple Brewer. I like this one. Here. Nothing to clean in the middle. Air pump hooks up. Um, you fill your tank up with water, throw your little bit of humic acid in there to make sure that the uh, chlorine is on. Um, Turn your air pump on, open the valve, it starts bubbling away. There's your compost bag, you put your compost in here, and then hang that down into your um, airstream. Your bubble's coming up, so you're extracting really, really well. You gotta take the compost out about six to eight hours into the tea through, and then just let it finish up. And then you close the valve, Unhook your, uh, for in this particular instance, you just switch it over to your drain. Um, if you have to, you put a pump on this to pump into whatever you need to pump into. As you um, drain your compost out, put it into your sprayer. Um, I'm usually just uh, washing any of the biofilm on the edges down in the drain. It just gets washed out right in and there. What is this one called? It's called the Dirt Simple. It's sold by uh, Earth, for, Earth Fortification Supply Company. Um, it's Matt Slaughter's company. So, yeah. Uh, Ooh, now these are fine. Take old dairy tanks and then really large pods. These are like a thousand gallon versions. And uh, here comes the compost. And yeah, coming on over, way too much compost. So I got to drop that by about a third. You didn't need to put that much in. And we have a lot of compaction problems in here because look, this is a solid bottom. You know, you need to put air pipes into the compost. So big disc diffusers on the bottom, bumping away as they're um, blowing more um, air out of those big air diffusers, but those air diffusers sit off the bottom of the tank by you know, a good six inches. So the air's coming up here and it's getting movement, but the movement of your water is back to your disc if you're it up. It's not to the bottom of the tank. So they would get a layer 
their sludge on the bottom of their tank, usually about an inch thick. And most of their fungi ended up in the sludge on the bottom of the tank. Just not a good brewer design. And they had no way to pop those air seeds off the bottom. So there was no way to turn the disc diffusers over and clean the threads on the bottom of the disc diffuser. So first tea brew, pretty good. Second one, not so wonderful. Third, why waste your time? Really quickly. There's lots of different versions. All kinds of different versions. There's Elaine looking at one. Somebody's um, put one together in South Africa. You know, so let's look inside. You see my face coming going, what the hell? It's down there. You're going to make tea with a brick inside here and a stone holding your aeration system. So this is just that, um, um, what do you call it, how when you have a hose out there that... It's a hose. They do. It's a hose. And so they just twist it around a metal pipe or a metal ring. And of course, because the soap hose, when it fills up with air, it tends to float to the top. We're trying to tie it down by putting these rocks and stones and um, bricks on top of it. So I asked them how much biofilm grows on the brick and the stone, and they just kind of look at me like, what are you talking about, lady? When you've got a soap hose, and that's in a tea group, the organisms get inside those little fibers and they start growing very rapidly and it goes anaerobic and fucked inside the soaker hose really fast. And now you can't make good tea. So maybe the first brew would be okay, maybe the second, but the third or fourth, forget it. It's just worthless. So they changed their design after I came the first time. Okay. How much biology grows on the rebar? <laughs> What's the effect of the uh, uh, toxic chemicals coming off the rebar when your bacteria and fungi start chewing on it? This is a plastic pipe with holes in it. What happens if you forget and you turn the aeration off before you take the tea out? Well, let me show it's you. Like the water. Oh, this is a drain. Uh, you gotta clean that off. This is biofilm. It's not going to help them make a good brew. So we slip open that plastic tube that they had in the bottom. Uh, this is dried out biofilm on the inside of that pipe. <clears throat> How could you possibly? This is what's up. You get a liquid inside here. What are you blowing out? Now look at this. A real good aeration when all your little aeration holes are plugged up. So you cannot, if you use this kind of design, you've got bubblers or something inside your machine, do not forget and turn your aeration system off while that pipe is still in the tea. Or you're going to have to pick this up, you're going to have to clean that pipe, you're going to have to go around and you're going to have to poke, I don't know, what would you poke in here to clean all those little holes? I don't want to do that. Does that not sound like a freaking sort of thing to do? So there are lots of different tea brewers. Whenever you're thinking about getting a tea brewer, you might give me a ring and ask me about it. So coverage, oh, we've covered all those things, we covered that. Coverage on the um, leaf surface is what we're doing after when we're doing a tea. We want to show you this piece of data. When you start the tea brew, maximum oxygen concentration in your water because you've been aerating the water. You should be aerating for several hours, hopefully, before you start the tea brew to get rid of any chlorine, get the chlorine acid in there. So, max oxygen concentration based on temperature and uh, barometric pressure. So the higher the barometric pressure, the more oxygen you can have in your water. The lower the barometric pressure, the less oxygen. So it varies, it bounces around. So this is a Port House, Oregon, on a warm summer day. So eight parts per million oxygen. We're about uh, 800 feet elevation. So we're not sea level like you guys are. 
When you first start, your activity is pretty low. You're starting to extract, you're starting to get the organisms growing, so you're getting a greater and greater oxygen demand. And at some point, because the organisms are growing so fast, they're going to start using up more oxygen than is diffusing, even with a really good aeration rate. So, at what point then did we go anaerobic in this tuber? Well, I go to each six parts per million, and what is that time? It's about 18 hours into the tea group. This <laughs> tea went anaerobic. If we have any problem organisms in the tea group, we're going to start growing them. They're going to be winning. We're losing our filamentous fungi. Whoops, no more filamentous fungi. Our good guys are gone. Our protozoa, flagellus amoebae, are gone. We're growing cilia. Well, but the organisms kept growing until they ran out of food. And then, because they don't have food to grow on, you see the activity dip down, kind of gets to a stable point there along the line. But, you know, if this is low enough, you may come back to the aerobic conditions. Now you may think that your tea brew has been aerobic, except if you measure all the way through the tea brew, uh, this part of the middle of the night, um, you destroyed everything good about your tea brew. If you turn the aeration off, you got everything just crashes. So, knowing with this particular tea brewer that we have this problem, what would you do to deal with this kind of situation with this tea brewer? Less food. Less food. Pretty simple. If you were watching your oxygen start to dip down into the anaerobic conditions, wouldn't you empty out half your tea and just replenish it with fresh water? Because then instantly things back up and no problem. And unless you're aware of this kind of problem, you might forget to test for this. Now, when we first started doing compost tea brewing, we did best at uh, EDC labs. Said what? Well, I'm, yeah, okay. So she tested that she did a tea brew. She tested oxygen at eight hours. She tested oxygen at 24 hours. And said she has the data to prove that this tea brew did not go anaerobic. And yet she was finding E. coli growing in this tea brew at 24 hours. Did that tea brew, in fact, Stay aerobic for the whole entire time. She kind of missed the really important part of the whole cycle, didn't she? So, just when we're putting out data like this, and you know, reviewers aren't paying any attention. So, you know, there's that report in the scientific literature that says it doesn't matter if you keep it aerobic the whole time; you might still grow E. coli in there. So the only way you would know is with your microscope to keep checking every couple hours? And so the first time you make a tea brew, with this amount of food, that amount of food, this compost, yeah, you might want to check it. But, you know, do you have to check every couple hours? No, focus on this time. So focus, you know, like um, here and, and there and there and there. So make sure that this is happening in the middle of the day. Not in the middle of the night. What about a DO meter? Would that be useful? DO meter would be useful. So, um, once you've established what your recipe is, then you got it set. You don't have to keep checking. Is there turbidity here? Oxygen growth. So, oh. oxygen. Um, when you start seeing things go anaerobic, this is what's going to happen to your fungi. So as soon as that oxygen starts dropping below six parts per million, see that little hypha in the middle of this mass of bacteria? Anaerobic bacteria will attach to and destroy your filamentous fungi. So they are happily in the process of wiping that good guy fungus out, gone in about 20 minutes. He's going to be gone and uh, Good indicator that right now is the time to take that extra compost tea out and refill with good oxygenated water.
we talk about this. So here's the next two through that we did where we reduced the amount of food and the temperature was a little bit lower. So oxygen and air got down to anaerobic conditions. No problems with this T group. So this is really what you want to be seeing. Uh, we've tested a lot of different tea brewers. Most of these guys aren't actually on the market anymore. So um, there were you know, the Earth Tea Brewer, the Kiss Brewer, the I have no idea. Um, a couple different brewers. James Cecil Brewer. Uh, so I'll see. Uh, the Rowing Solutions machine before they change the design. Um, looking at active total bacteria, active total fungi, kind of the desired rain minimum ranges for the LOC. All of these guys in pretty good um, levels. You know, ooh, there must have been some molasses in this one, huh? Look at those bacteria. Uh, pretty good fungal levels. Ooh, this, you know, that one's really. But um, what Bruce, this is sort of tea brewer, this is Bruce Elliott's um, tea brewer. What he didn't tell us was he was starting to put trichoderma into his tea brewer. So of course he got really good fungal levels because he was putting fungal spores in there. Um, and then these ones were, you know, really anaerobic, uh, clearly was not providing enough aeration to keep things, to keep the fungi alive. All the same compost used for all of these extractors in this experiment, but we did use the manufacturer's foods. So we followed their directions to make their teas. We started everything with the same compost, and you can see some differences. You know, so if you use his material, we run a bunch of ovary or trichoderma. And that's, that doesn't really count. Um, but that's all super machine is just right. Gotta fix that aeration in there. Cleaning the machine. So how many times you're working with uh, tea brewer manufacturers and then somebody says, well, come on out and see my tea brewer. Great, come on out. Now you are cleaning it. You're cleaning your tea brewer, right? You're telling me that you're cleaning the tea brewer. Absolutely, my tea brewer is as clean as on the day it arrived here. We keep it spotless. Great. So we walk into that back room. There's a tea brewer. Yes, it is clean. On the outside. There's a important part of a tea brewer. On the outside. No, it's on the inside. So uh, I've seen a hundred. Tea brewers were beautiful on the outside, really nice, clean got nice and skippy. Look inside and look at this. How many times has he run this tea brewer and not cleaned it out? Not made any methods ever to take that high pressure hose and wash that biofilm off the edge. Look at this air pipe going down. See all that slime, all that biofilm? There's no way that this is a good tea. No way. It looks pretty, doesn't it? Looks nice and brown. Mm -hmm. All that tells you is it's got humic acids in it. That's it. Got a little bit of foam on the top. Mm -hmm. Doesn't really mean anything. Foam just means you have certain types of proteins or amino acids in the um, compost or the compost tea. Doesn't tell you anything about the quality of that group. So about all I can tell you here is that it's not a good group. How bad is it? So for a tea brewer, this is the one where water comes out the bottom, it goes through the pump every single time, comes back through and there's a the venturi. This is that the venturi is pumping your tea, it should have been pumping air and in training the tea, not having the tea run through the pump. She doesn't like anybody's tea. <laughs> You, you, you told them to do the process slightly differently for that one. Slightly, like, absolutely reversed. <laughs> and, uh, ah, it's wonderful when you talk to people about the way it needs to be done and then they 
So on whatever surface they're occupying, they're making that glue layer to prevent themselves from getting washed away. They do this on your compost, they do this on your roots, anything. Now this particular bacterium is a pathogenic bacterium. Antibody antigen interaction, that's what the less of an interaction happens here, which is now allowing this infection thread. And there's the bacterium inside the host cell. So there's the next one, and an infection thread is starting. This is a dead organism. We don't know it yet, but it's definitely got a problem coming its way. We want to make sure that all these infection sites are already occupied by somebody beneficial. And so it's coverage. We want this organism established here to be a good guy, not a bad guy. So let us make certain that all of these infection sites are occupied by a beneficial organism. So here's the experiment that we did. This was a vineyard not far from um, the lab in Cormelis. This particular year, we had a late frost, so they weren't going to be growing any grapes anyway. I love you because you do a job on their vineyards. And so they agreed that we could go out here and we could establish um, gray mold on all of the plants. So everything. Well, you can't read it out here, but you can read it in your books. It says a hundred percent of the grape leaves were covered by um, seventy percent coverage by the Botrytis scenario grape mold. So all through this whole vineyard. We made certain that all of the leaf surfaces, all parts of the plant, were 70 percent covered with gray mold before we ever started the experiment. Oh yeah, we're going to be causing some disease in here. Then, split the system so that this just this part of the system just got water. So there's our control. What happens when you have a bad case of um, gray mold happen? And this got covered 10% with compost tea. And so we, have, we took leaf samples before we sprayed, leaf samples after, so we could show an increase of coverage of the leaves by 10%. And then here, this was covered 50%, this was covered 70%, and this was covered 100% with the compost heat. So after the disease was established, we come in and put these different percentages on that leaf material. Three weeks later, we went out to the vineyard and looking in this section of the vineyard, all of the leaves looked like this one. There was absolutely no disease. You could not detect any gray mold in this section of the vineyard, despite the fact that we established Green mold on here before we put the tea. What was the period of time? Three weeks. Do you have to cover? Well, let's let's look at what it looks like when you cover by a hundred percent. When you're looking in here, there are bacteria, there are fungi active, growing on these leaf surfaces, such that there is no um, visualization of the chlorophyll. Chlorophyll auto fluoresces a bright orange color. There is no color chlorophyll um, that you can see in this picture. The whole leaf is covered every little bit. Now, you know, right here, it looks like that bacterium maybe has a little space around it. But there's the slime layer. This is the slime that that bacterium is producing. So we are protecting that leaf surface. Now we've got uh, three or four bacteria right there, but the slime that they're producing is covering that leaf surface. So you don't have you don't have to have shoulder to shoulder microorganisms. That's not going to happen. But everything's covered. You can't see any chlorophyll. Does it have to be covered 100 percent? Well, so the next section over. Went out there after three weeks. No disease in here. None to be found. So if we cover by 70 percent. What happens when we only cover by 
This is a 50% covered leaf, and you can see those areas where the chlorophyll is shining through. There's nothing blocking it, and you can see that there's empty space. When that dried spore falls on the surface, it has plenty of food. It can germinate, it can start to grow. There are infection sites that are free on the surface. <coughs> Well, you can actually see the botrytis here actually growing. This is what botrytis looks like, very narrow diameter. It's stained with fluorescent diacetate, so we can tell you that it is active and growing. If we didn't have the fluorescein, it would just be a clear, colorless fungal hypha. And so uh, we know that this has got a really bad case of, of uh, botrytis, of gray mold. So when we pick this leaf off the um, plant, that's what it looked like at three weeks. So if we don't cover our leaf surfaces by 50%, we're in trouble. The mildew's going to get us, the botrytis is going to get us, the black spot, the whatever from the disease, it's not going to be adequately protected. Those people who fail when they have vitamin or C might it be because they have not adequately covered their leaf surface. They didn't get enough organisms to protect that leaf. But to achieve 50% coverage versus 100%, you just dilute more, or? Um, you just want to make sure that you have adequate numbers of organisms. So remember what I was saying with the number of organisms on your compost tea? Right, right, right. Yep. That's what you want to see in that tea, so you know you're going to get coverage. When your outfit spraying five gallons per acre, we will get adequate coverage, at least every time we've looked at it. Um, so when you're first starting to do this, and you're spraying a compost tea out, you might want to pick some leaves and send them into the lab in Corvallis or, or um, New York, so that you can make sure that you're getting good coverage, that your sprayer isn't messing up somewhere along the line. But you don't have to do that many times. If you know that your system's working, you get good coverage, so um, you learn what you have to have in your tea with your little microscope to be successful. But that's why some of those examples here in this book, I think that's why they failed. They didn't do anything to assure that they had the biology and the compost that they used. They didn't have any data to assure that they were getting that uh, biology into the tea or that they were covering the surfaces adequately <coughs> to actually protect the what happens, you know, because let's keep going with this experiment, what happens with 10% coverage? Oh man, yeah. You know, um, the leaves on those plants were already starting to decompose in place. When you go to the, into that um, water alone, these plants were completely defoliated three weeks later. There weren't even leaves to pick off the plants. So the um, grower whose vineyard this was was sort of like, is this going to problem? Has a problem with my plants next year? Is is this going to affect my yields in the in the coming year? And we're like, look them out, let's take compost tea and make sure that we don't have any problems. We'll just do it for free for you, okay? Because we never suspected it would be quite this devastating. So coverage, adequate coverage, is really what you want to do. So typical applications. Soil drench, 20 gallons per acre in the spring, get it harvest, or put out one ton compost burner. Apply it on a seed. When you're going on to annual plants, almost tea goes out at the first true leaf stage. And then pre blossom, which is about a month later, post blossom, which is about a month, about a month after that. When we're dealing with perennials, you put your first application of compost tea at the soil. Many of our fungal diseases, the spores establish on the bud. So you want to get that completely covered with a compost tea. And then you come out once the buds uh, break. <laughs> so once the leaves are out, once your blossoms are out, you know, on the land. Um, and get those adequately covered, and then typically a month later. When we're dealing with something as devastating as apple scab, we gen generally are going to have a fourth application. So bud swell, 
when um, the bus actually break, we'll put out another application a month after that and a month after that. So we usually don't have any problems with that with staff. It's covered. That's what you have to have. Ooh, where do we put the teeth? You know, and, uh, when you put, for instance, either the soil dredge or the compost on, and you're not putting in it, you are putting in there. I would tend not to turn under things unless you've got really bad compaction. So there's, some, you know, for me to recommend something else, I have to have you tell me some other ameliorating condition to make me want to till things in. Certainly the first time we start, this field has been in the world of toxic chemical agriculture. Okay, I will probably um, get it till because I've got to get the biology down into that soil as good as I can to break up the compaction as far down as I can. But then after that, no, I'm not going to be tilling. So then we can only leave the compost on the surface and just kind of want to just like it in for the Well, if I'm putting it on the surface, um, typically in the springtime where sun isn't as much of a factor, or in the fall where um, all of the residues that have gone down, hopefully that compost will help decompose that. If there's going to be a problem with hot sun, drying everything out, then I would put the mulch there on the bread, straw, dead leaves. All, all leaves are wonderful in the temperate world. So around here, we have a lot of wind. You don't know what's today, but we have a lot of wind. We have windmills. <laughs> So, you know, some kind of blow around. Yeah. Dries out really fast. Protect that surface then. Um, it happens a lot in Australia. We almost invariably never just put the compost down. We put something over it to help protect it and hold it to the surface. And the compost the organisms in the compost help hold things to that surface with the compost typically. If I have a choice of putting out something, when it's raining, I'm going to put it out when it's raining, rather than waiting to the hot, dry um, day to put it out. Think about your organisms just like you would think of in a child. If you want to do it to a child, don't do it to the organisms you put now. You would not pin your children to the soil on a bright, hot, sunshiny day. <laughs> How long until that biology moves to three feet? And, and that just your, for example, that grass field. I mean, you apply it in that section. Is that rest of that grass going to come alive in the next year? In this particular case, it, it didn't move out much at all. Um, this was a compost heap, and someone just kind of went like that and put it out on the, on the grass. Um, and you really, you really couldn't tell where it had been put out come um, June because there was plenty of rain, wasn't any problems. So this is like three months later, and uh, it has that compost seed out this way some, I, I think it has. Okay. Does it continue to move out? Well, it's hard for me to say because, of course, what did the uh, Parks Department in Portland do? Discovery. Okay. 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 Because they wanted everything. So, um, anyway, you want to be putting out your compost tea, um, you know, skid sprayer, jet spray, tea jets, and uh, just uh, you know, check and make sure that uh, you're not killing all your organisms. So, be collecting some of the um, tea here and finding out what's coming through the system. If not much of anything is coming through, then it's time to rethink. Go find the filters, remove the filters, and go change your pump, something like that. Last study, I promise, this is it. Because <laughs> those of you who are in pastures, you probably want to see this. This is where we, that we did in New Zealand, and I love the fact that the guy's name is supposed to be Snodgrass. <laughs> so, in the background, this is a um, two areas. Fenced off on a dairy farm. It was a conventional dairy farm. So the farm basically has 
It's like um, 350 acre farm. Most of the farm buildings are in the center of the, um, of the area. So it was pretty easy for us to um, choose this side of the farm would stay conventional and this farm, part of the farm would go biological or sustainable or whatever you want to call the system we're talking about. We tried to pick as uniform a place so that this one acre area looked very, very similar to that one acre area. We didn't have wet spots, we didn't have dry spots. The same species of grass, you know, looked pretty much the same through the year previous to the study <coughs> before we fenced off these particular areas. And then we um, harvested these areas. We always mowed on the same day. Um, we tried to let the grass cover recover in both areas and not mow too often. Um, let the other, you know, let both of the areas catch up before we um, mow them again. A little bit difficult, but so we mow them every 23 days. We accumulated everything, mixed the material together, weighed it, so we knew how much yield, and then sent tissue tests off to a laboratory for tissue analysis. But, uh, conventional dairy farm in Bay Plenty, this is just outside of Rongarura on the northern island. Um, all the chemistry was done at Hill Lab, all of the soil biology was done at Bassett Island Lab in New Zealand. Uh, there was an ag consultant because a number of the uh, uh, conventional people in New Zealand were really, really concerned. <coughs> <coughs> they knew we were going to go out in the middle of the night and put um, fertilizer on <laughs> our bed. Oh, look at that. Yeah, turn it on. That helps a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, <coughs> this guy made sure that we didn't cheat at all. Um, the seasons are reversed, so our springtime is October there, and the um, end of the summertime period is late February. So, the trial over that period of time. Compost tea, um, three applications of compost tea, and fish hydrolysate. Uh, at 150 liters per hectare, so uh, a little bit higher dose rate than um, on my wells, around 20 gallons per acre. And so every four weeks, so once a month, starting in October, so October, November, December, compost seed was put out at about 20 gallons per acre. The additional food was uh, fish eye policy. No fertilizer was put on this half of the farm for a full year in advance of spraying compost tea on this side of the farm. Because the concern was, by the ag consultant, that the reason this biological stuff works is because it's just skating along on the residual fertilizer that's left over from all those many years when we've been putting all this chemical out there. So, you know, it's not a real thing. So we made sure no fertilizers put out here at all through the entire year before. So we had a whole year where we were looking and watching, paying attention to everything. In the conventional plot, um, they were applying urea at a rate of 450 kilograms, which is about 450 pounds per acre. Every um, six to eight weeks, there have been 75 pounds of that um, fertilizer on, and they were we putting out supplement in a rate of about, uh, I think it was 10 pounds <coughs> per acre going out. So pretty massive levels of inorganic fertilizers going on to the conventional side. There's a difference in yields. For a whole entire year, no fertilizers put out here, and yet we're making a full ton greater yield, and we don't have weeds in the compost tea side. We still got some pretty nasty weeds over here, not as good forage. So um, looking at what were the plants that were growing up, well we've seen this before, haven't we? 
the clover came out. And again, there was this big concern about, oh no, the animals on this side of the farm are going to suffer a blow because look at all the clover growing over here. No animal on this side of the farm suffered from bloat. In fact, there were so few visits to any of the animals in the dairy herd on this side that the farmer said, you know, I uh, funded this whole study just on the savings that I made from not having to vet, have a vet come out and visit the animals on this side of the farm. All of these animals in the study, the whole herd, was suffering from facial eczema. At the beginning of the study, every single one had this disease. Um, there was a, a lot of well, true ha ha about this particular problem in the dairy herds at this time. Because I, I don't know if you know what facial eczema is, but it's a muscle wasting disease of all of the facial muscles. And eventually, um, all of these muscles atrophy and the lower jaw it drops off the animal. Oh, it's really oh. disgusting. The animal can't eat, it starves. So, devastating problem in uh, the dairy industry in this part of the world. What causes it? There was all kinds of studies about, is it a disease, is it a virus, is it bacterial, is it a fungal disease, is it, you know, ticks, is it fleas, or what was causing it? And just huge amounts of money to deal with this particular problem. So all of the animals had that problem when we started. But, you know, these animals did not suffer blow. Well, who were the animals that suffered blow? The animals were on that side. Well, all that urea and converted into nitrate, and the plants storing luxury amounts of nitrate in the leaf material of that grass. That's what causes bloat in animals. It's them eating excess nitrate. So, look at the difference in mineral content. We're looking at the increase in all of these nutrients in the biologically treated grass as compared to the chemically raised grass. Percent increase over the control. Nitrogen, and all of this is protein. It is not nitrate. We do not have nitrate in the plant material. This is all protein. Increase by about 18%. <coughs> if you're increasing um, protein in the uh, grass by about 18%, all the animals are doing better. They're much healthier. Um, we didn't lose any of the, um, of the newborn calves in that year on the animals on the side of the um, farm. Phosphorus increased by about 12%, potassium increased by about 10%, um, 8% or something like that. Calcium pulled 20% increase in calcium. The milk being produced was increased. I think they said it was a uh, $300 increase in milk production per acre on this side of the farm, and that's half the acreage of the farm. Zinc increased, copper increased, boron, molybdenum, whoa, cobalt, selenium. Doesn't this look scary? How can you have an increase of 110% of some nutrient? Because there was absolutely no cobalt, absolutely no selenium in the grass from the chemically grown part of of the um, farm, not to be found. So micronutrient problems. All of the animals on this side of the farm where they're getting adequate um, cobalt and selenium, all of these animals recovered from facial eczema. At the end of the study, there was no animal in this part of the herd that had that wasting disease. These animals still had it. So tell me, what causes facial eczema? <laughs> Mineral deficiency. Because it's not in the grass in that area that's receiving the chemical treatments. Is it the biology that caused the shift? Well, when we're looking at active bacteria, total bacteria, much higher in the control. We've actually brought that bacterial activity and biomass down to just about the same level as we increase the fungi. 
We're balancing bacteria and fungi almost exactly right. Mm, it would be a little better. Remember, I want 300 and 300. But look at the difference from what it was in that nutritionally unbalanced grass to where we have nutritionally balanced grass. Huge shift. Our fungal to bacterial biomass ratio went from something that does not support the growth of healthy grass to something that does support a growth of healthy grass. We might want to continue moving this lawn to grow even better grass, but that's for next year. Our, fungal, our species of fungi improved dramatically. We did not have adequate nutrient cycling. Protozoa are too low, and here we're getting the protozoa up well beyond the level that we're getting new improved nutrient cycling. What does that silly number tell you? <laughs> it's still on the road with that soil. Compaction. Compaction layer? Well, so it's causing to come with the grass over on that side of the farm. Compaction. Heavy gallons. So, <laughs> we, are, we are ameliorating that compaction problem over here? Not completely. You know, we got a little more work to do. And notice that there's absolutely no mycorrhizal colonization on the chemical side of the farm. But we're starting to get mycorrhizal colonization on the biological part of the farm. So, of course, this grower, what did he do in the next year? The whole entire farm went biological. Because with those kinds of results, how could you not? So, follow up that when you look at the different nematodes, increased bacteria feeding nematodes by 128%. Bad, you know. Now we need the guys to woo hoo, we've got them. Um, increase the fungal feeders, 60%. We dropped the bad guys by 87%. We wiped out the root feeding nematodes practically overnight. Get the proper biology in your soil, we control your root feeders. You got a root feeding nematode problem here, Hawaii? Get your biology out there. And we can very rapidly take care of this. But you can't just be throwing brown water at things. You've got to be throwing organisms to solve the problem. So, there's the number $307 per hectare. There we go. So, yes, yeah.